Hello, I'm Betsy Stone and uh, welcome to Pictures at an Exhibition. This is a program uh, involving short 15-minute interviews with artists who are showing work in Amherst. And today we are at Hope and Feathers Gallery with Laura Radwell, who is a landscape painter uh, in an abstract style. Hope and Feathers is located on Main Street in Amherst and is also a frame shop. So um, it focuses on local artists' work, both emerging and established local artists, and is very involved in the community. I'd like to introduce Laura Radwell. Welcome, Laura, uh, to Pictures at an Exhibition. And uh, we are at Hope and Feathers. Uh, this this one-person exhibit is small, and it's a little jewel. Uh, I love the colors of it. I love the landscapes. And I'm very curious about your trajectory as an artist. Uh, how have you gotten to this point? Where did you start in, in your art career? Well, I will try to compress this into a very brief answer. I, as a young person, thought I wanted to be an artist, but my vision was not sufficiently clear, and my parents wanted me to follow another path. So. What happened is that all throughout my earlier adulthood, everything that I did, I gravitated toward incorporating a visual component of some sort. Mm. And in the 1980s, I started a business in communication and marketing, and I hired designers to work with to service the clients. It became so apparent to me that what I should be doing was doing the design because I could get to work with the visual part of me and have some form of visual expression. So one thing led to another and for close to 25 years I did design, uh, mostly two-dimensional but sometimes um, other types of installations. And fast forward about 20 years I became um, dissatisfied with the fact that I couldn't express myself visually in a, in a larger way using just the components that I had been used using in my design work. And I started to do some photographic work with photographs that I took. And because I knew the design software, I created these digital abstracts using real world images but because I could layer them, I could transform them and create interesting textures and forms and shape. And I did that for the last several years while I was still running my business. But it was always clear to me in the back of my mind that I had to paint. I knew that. That was a, a, a long-held dream. So in 2014, I started to wind down the business and I started painting. And I was painting very small, little tentative landscapes and here I am, and I've gone through several stages in the last five years in terms of the focus of my work. And I've arrived here now in this body of work called Embodied Landscapes. Great, let's talk about one of these pieces. I've seen this piece on postcards and, and uh, promotion, um, and I love this piece. I see why it was chosen. It's, just got, it's got it all. It's got... Uh, uh, I can see the sense of landscape in the horizontal line, but you've, you know, you've exploded it. It's, it's got wonderful color and expression. Um, how, how do you uh, conceptualize a piece like this? Where does this start for you? Conceptualize is an interesting word because I think that all of the years of running a business meant that I had to be supremely disciplined and I had to track very carefully all the details that were involved in servicing any client and doing an account, and I felt very contained. So what characterizes most of my painting, whether it's this body of work or a previous body of work, is spontaneity and improvisation. Mm -hmm. And I wait for a day when I feel inspir inspiration. Hmm. 
And this painting in particular, I knew that I needed to work large. And I, I took a, a black charcoal and I just danced around the canvas with it. Mm -hmm. I made shapes. And I wasn't sure where it was going. What does emerge, as you pointed out, is the horizon is still here. I can't seem to let go of landscape because it's such a major influence in all mm -hmm. of my work, um, from one body to another. And I made shapes. And then I had an idea that morning of colors that I wanted to use. I wanted to use some colors that was somewhat different. I use a lot of blue in my painting, but this is a very subdued, slightly off, um, you know, with, uh, softened by black and by dark areas. And I mix a palette on my table, and I've created these shapes, and then I stand back and I look at it, and I go, hmm, okay, uh, where do I go from here? And I just really give myself the freedom to take up the brushes and start filling in color. Sounds like fun. It is, I want to do it. It, it is. <laughs> it is. It's, it's very playful, uh -huh. and it's very immediate, and I think um, I'm very conscious about not wanting to get hung up and the plan was this and mm -hmm. I'm supposed to do that. Mm -hmm. I have no training or little to no training in art. It's just something that has been inside me. And I think it's a fortunate thing that I'm not bound by the rules because mm -hmm. I don't know the rules. Mm -hmm. you know? So I just paint. Yeah, that, that is a fortunate thing. Um, a lot of people who our highly trained artists say, oh, you really didn't miss anything by not going to art school. Um, but, okay, so this is embodied landscape. Um, what do you mean by that, embodied? And um, how is that the, the direction your, your work is going in right now? Okay, well, I have to rewind a couple of years, or, well, back to 2014 when I started painting landscapes. And they were... I wouldn't say they were representational or realistic, but they were tighter um, <clears throat> as obvious landscape. And the areas of color and the textures blended mm. one into another and overlapped, and it was very dreamy. Shall we look at one of those? So we were just talking about the more atmospheric, looser qualities of your previous work, and, and here's a painting that is is a predecessor to what we're, we're seeing in this exhibit. So can you talk about this a little bit? Yeah, sure. Um, this painting is representative of a direction that I developed earlier on after returning to painting in 2014. And it uh, has a lot of sky. The sky is a fascinating uh, gift in my life. I could paint the sky forever. And it's landscape, clearly but it's abstracted, it's totally imagined. I have never been to this place. Uh, a lot of people ask me when I'm painting, where is that, where is that? And I can't really say, it's wherever you want it to be. Um, and it also shows how everything is softly blended and I use markings on the surface of the paintings because it uh, it's a way of communicating my sponta spontaneity and my impulsiveness while I'm, while I'm painting. And it also gives an interesting layer of perhaps age, where it suggests some imperfection, which is a, a concept that I really like to think about, imperfection. Laura, this is just gorgeous. The colors are so luscious in this painting, and I love the way the, the horizon is so low, and you kind of bring the eye to this this point. Uh, did you enjoy painting this one? I mean, this one that came easily, or what was the experience of painting? Well, this was an interesting story because I was asked to do an interview on public television, and part of the interview was a request to actually be filmed while I was painting. Yikes. So I started, <laughs> yeah, yikes. I started with a blank canvas. Um, I had a background color on it. I knew that I was in an orange mood, and I had my palette laid out. And there was nothing I could do except let it happen. Mm -hmm. And despite someone right over my shoulder, I just painted it, and it came out. And 
this is it. Yeah. Well, um, I see you've got some of that, that uh, line quality in there um, that you scratched in to it. Um, how did you do these? I don't know if the camera can pick up this almost comb line combed in there. That looks like fun. I, I have a variety of tools and combs and brushes and little pointy instruments that I use that I just grab, you huh. know, and and make these make these lines and it adds texture, which is something that I love. Huh. And, um, the interest, another interesting thing about this painting, and again, I had no configuration in mind, I just came as I started the painting, is the question about essence and when the essence comes into a piece of work and how do you know when you're done? Mm. Yes, how do you know when you're done? I, sometimes it's very evident and sometimes I know that it's not done but I don't know how it's going to be done or when it's going to be done. Uh -huh. But the question arises, like, this painting has its essence, it has something that speaks already, mm -hmm. and then why go further, mm -hmm. you know? And this is a, an example of that because I've looked at this painting since and thought, should I have done more? Does it need more? But yet, perhaps your response to it attests to the fact that it's okay the way it is. Yeah, I can't, uh, this is perfect yeah. in my eyes. Yeah. Huh. Okay. Laura, I want to talk more about your, your title, Embodied Landscape. Um, and this piece has such a feeling of landscape, but it's also very physical and organic looking to me. Um, how did this come about? Well, this is, Embodied landscape is kind of a convergence of ideas that have been bouncing around in my head and, about, and also in little small sketches of work that I have done like while traveling or while in France. And the countryside in France was so absolutely beautiful, but it was very divided into sections. You know, you looked out on a field and it was there were several fields that intersected and the, the shape and the geometry was just overwhelmingly beautiful. And that started to take a bigger role in, my, in the painting that I was doing there. And at the same time, I started to do a little bit of figure drawing. And very loose, very yeah. abstract. And I was using pencil and mixed media and then wondered one day how this might come together in a, work and were, were these things separate directions or would they ever manifest together mm -hmm. on a surface? And this, in essence, is really what, rep, what is the result, I think, mm -hmm. of that thinking and that, you know, the curves and contours of the body resemble the curves and contours of the landscape often. Yes. Yes. Hillsides, uh, roads, pathways, um, so this is, this is the result. This body of work is really the result of that kind of thinking. You know, mm -hmm. Some drawing, some sketching, some thought about anatomy, and also the beauty of the landscape and mm -hmm. how it's divided. You're, you were talking about um, France, a trip to France. So um, uh, this happened, what, a couple of years ago? Well, I was in, in France. France. It was an artist residency, and I was there for two weeks about one year ago, and then I returned in the month of May for a month because two weeks was not enough. Mm -hmm. And it was a very uh, fruitful experience. I felt incredibly inspired and also liberated from everything that happens here. And just putting oneself in a different environment is can often open doors. Mm -hmm. Are you going again? I am going again. What? I am. <laughs> Wonderful. How long will you go this time? I will go for a month. Yeah. I think two weeks is too short. Mm -hmm. I know a month might be a tad long, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, in terms of gearing up and then packing up, and you need, I need more than two weeks. Mm -hmm. and I, you are using oils here. These are all oils. Oh, yeah. So you're ta are you taking your oils to France or are you working in another medium? I, I take oil and then uh, at the end of my previous experiences, I used acrylic, which was hard for me to do. I had to force myself because I'm not an acrylic painter. Mm -hmm. 
And I may do that again, or I may change my medium and find other products that help me uh, dry the paintings more quickly. Mm -hmm. But you know, I'll see. And maybe I'll do some, something entirely different. Mm -hmm. No idea. Mm -hmm. yeah. Laura, this is an interesting part of your series. Um, this, you know, predominant color, this blue, cool colors. Were you in a blue phase, like Picasso went through his blue phase? I'm always in a blue phase. I love blue, I love turquoise, turquoise. I love every variation of blue. I love green. And uh, this series is noteworthy in it, to me because it's smaller real estate and I had to contain myself on a smaller canvas and yet I knew what I was trying to do and I was glad to see the results that I could achieve the same type of division in the landscape, um, the same structure. I think they are lyrical but they're also muscular at the same time. Um, the color contributes to the feeling of um, dreaminess, which is still a characteristic that I taken from my previous body of work. And this one is also interesting because I wanted to intentionally leave the turquoise blue, uh, periwinkle blue, other types of blue, and incorporate uh, slightly different tones, and then add this crazy lavender pink to it. Mm, yeah. And I wasn't sure how that was going to work out, but it, it turned out that I felt good about it. So. Yeah. And thank you for watching this first segment of Pictures at an Exhibition featuring Laura Radwell's exhibit, Embodied Landscape, which is up until the 29th of November at Hope and Feathers Gallery, Main Street in Amherst. Also, if you would stay tuned, my friend Ava Fierst will be interviewing Abital Sagalin, uh, at, whose work is at the University Museum of Contemporary Art. Thank you. Welcome back. I am Eva Fierst, and I'm standing here in the exhibition space of Museum of Contemporary Art at UMass. Today we are going to interview Avital Segalen, who has, uh, who has had work that has spanned over a long time, about 50 or 60 years. The museum here at UMass used to be the university gallery and it started out about 40 years ago. Uh, it got renamed 15 years ago or so because uh, the space is not only a gallery space, but a museum with a prominent collection of over 3,000 works on paper. Uh, it has a very strong educational component to it and uh, works oftentimes, exhibitions oftentimes are being uh, curated by undergraduate students as well as uh, graduate students. So here we are in the museum and I would like to introduce you to Avital Sigalen. Avital, Hello. here we are yes. and uh, we're looking forward to a nice conversation. So we are now here in the uh, museum and we are sitting underneath one of the earliest paintings in this yes. room yes. and that's the horrors of war. Yes. Uh, we both are uh, immigrants and yes. uh, grew up in the shadow of World War II. Right. Um, to what extent did the art influence you in, uh, in the, the, to what extent did the historical events influence your art? I, I think it did, uh, that I am more interested in the immaterial uh, uh, world than the concrete world. 
because um, the concrete word, uh, world can disappear and uh, the immaterial world is something that stays on, the spirit of the immaterial world. I don't know if it's a good answer, but that's... I think it's yeah. a perfectly wonderful answer. And I think that is something that, um, that is uh, true for everybody, I think, yes. to, um, to focus on the immaterial world, yes. because the material is oftentimes uh, just too, it draws us into the wrong direction in some ways. Yes. Especially yes. in this uh, early 21st century. Yes. Yes. So, talking about the immaterial world, I think and this is what all your work is all about. It has to do with light and yes. with essence. Right. And so, I would like to ask you, yes. uh, you're trying to get an essence of an object. Right. Uh, what do you understand of an essence of something? Yes. How do you draw this? out of something and yes. then put it onto a piece of yes. paper. Yes, well, that's the reason why I paint very often the same subject, but it's never exactly the same. It's at, at the spirit of the, uh, the essence for me is really what really matters. It's the spirit of, of the situation or the object or the landscape or that, that's what it is, yes. So when, <clears throat> when do you think you have captured that spirit or the essence of something? At what point do you say, like, that's it? It's intuitive. And many artists work on a particular subject over and over again. Right. Uh, when do you stop doing that and move on to a different subject? When I feel that I answered what I was looking for. And I don't know exactly what I'm looking for, but when I'm satisfied that I've said uh, that I expressed what I wanted to express, so then I stop, and then I go on to something else. So here we are in a different part of the exhibition. And uh, one of the pieces that struck me uh, was this one here that is an image of the uh, Basilica San Marco in it Italy. Uh, and I would like to ask Avital, yes. uh, you are, uh, you talked earlier about immortality and the non-material world. Yes. And uh, in your work there is a lot of churches and mosques. Yes. Uh, so do you feel that architecture contains spirituality or what is it that attracts you? I guess architecture does um Yes, convey that. Yes, you're, you're right. I mean, to me. I was totally surprised when I saw this work because uh, of its colorfulness, but also about the uh, application of gold foil. Can you yes. tell me more about well, that? Well, I was, uh, when I saw San Marco, I immediately thought of Byzantine uh, architecture, and there's quite a bit of gold there. so. That's why I used uh, these uh, collages. That's the reason. So Byzantine architecture or Byzantine art yes. employs a lot of gold, but it's like halos and gold in background, which uh, you know has a precious timelessness to it. And and I think you were very uh, successful on combining this with Plaza San Marco because Byzantine art and Venice have a lot to do with each other. Yes, exactly. So you have also some other works here in this gallery that, uh, that show churches. So Avital, yes. let's just look at one of the paintings in, particularly, uh, in particular, the um, mosque painting that's right next to you. This is a very colorful image. And what makes this image identify for you the mosque. What's the essence of this mosque? Well, um, the domes and also the crescent on top. And, uh, and basically it was very architectural, very simple. And these are the forms that I was able to, to paint. Some kind of an entrance yes, in the right. Moorish 
yeah. architecture yes. and the shadow and light exactly. uh, playfulness exactly. of this. Exactly. Uh, the angles of the sun, the, of the um, shadows that yes. are being... Yes, because of the strong sun. The strong sun, exactly. yes. Yes, uh, and the, the colors of blue are various shades of blue that... Um, do they reflect the various uh, blues in the course of a day on the sky? Or what, what how would you interpret the blue in this work? How, how do I interpret the... The color blue in oh, this yes. work? Well, because the sky is very blue, the sea is very blue, so that's why. <laughs> Just as simple as that. <laughs> it's a very joyful piece, and it's, yes. it's, it's a beautiful piece. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. So here we are, all of a sudden in the new world, we are now in Providence, we are now in Provincetown, Massachusetts. And the work between Avital and me is, this is, I think, a significant work. And Avital, tell us a little bit more about this particular work and what it did for your career. Oh, yes. Well, I, I got a Fulbright because of that drawing. I had a painting of that, but um, I sold it. Uh, one of the few things, in fact, the teacher wanted to buy it while I was painting it, not this, but um, the painting of this. And I said, I can't uh, give it to you or, or even uh, sell it to you because I don't know how it will end. So <laughs> and I could have used the money, you know, art students. Of course. Others, yeah. yes. but, uh, no, but this, um, no, I consider this my best drawing. And I did it when I was still at Cooper Union, when I was still in college. And uh, I uh, stayed in a shack. In a sh it's a fisherman's shack, which was right on the water at that time. And uh, now, of course, Provincetown is full of bars. and No more shacks. No, no <laughs> more shack. And so I was able to, to draw this. So. I'm very critical of my work, but I think this one, I think that's good, pretty good. Yeah. So you have various other motifs of the ocean and the coast in yes. Maine and the boats. Right. Uh, what made you uh, choose those as subjects? Well, because I was in, uh, well, first I was in Provincetown. And, um, and I love to look at the sea, the way it changed colors during the day and evening. But um, uh, what was the question again? Yeah. What drew you to the coast and to make these works on water and the, and the you know, coastline? Well, I was just attracted. I just thought that the, since the water changes all the time and uh, and whatever belongs to the water, like boats, were very interesting to me. So that's why. So Avital, we are now standing in front of a work that has a lot of significance for you. Yes. And this was done in, it is titled Gord. Right. Which is a town in France. Can you tell us more about this? Well, it's a village, a, a mountain village historically dates back to the 13th century. It was a place where uh, lived um, a shoemaker uh, who belonged to the Shoemaker Guild. And it, it, when uh, after Paris, in Paris, I painted uh, Notre Dame and it disappeared. Each time I was trying to get the immaterial quality and finally I was painting, I was remove everything I felt the stone was too too heavy, and it didn't really, it, it, it didn't express what I tried to say. So I would always remove part of the painting. So at the end, I was painting white. I mean, it, and I thought that's it. I'm not a painter anymore. And an art critic said it's amazing that at my age, because I was very young at that time, I was in my early twenties, right after Cooper Union, that I. I uh, came to the conclusion that everything is, is an overstatement. So then I went to Gord. I was invited by my cousins. He was a professor of sociology in Paris, at the Sorbonne. And he 
was invited, and so was I, by Chagall, who was his friend, who bought the house there for very little money. At the time, it was something like 100 francs or something. Uh, and he was told by another painter uh, that uh, it's a great place to hide during the war. And so, um, and this was right after the war, so we went there. And there, the light was very striking, very strong, just the opposite of what I had experienced in Paris, especially at Notre Dame, which disappeared all the time. And this was all, all those, uh, so all I could see was uh, the, the torn down houses without roofs and without the roof because young people had to remove the roof uh, so that they wouldn't pay any taxes and young people didn't want to stay in the village after the war, they wanted to go to town. So the place was totally abandoned except for a couple of artists who found it and who told Chagall, you know, if you want to hide during the war, this is a good place. So when I went there, there was already a couple of art critics and a couple of other artists who were there. And so we stayed in the only place that had um, water. It was the schoolhouse. Everybody else had to go to the fountain. And I, so I came without anything, just uh, black pencils, because since I was paying nothingness, I felt I, I won't be able to paint. But this inspired me because everything was in the light or in the shadow and very, all the forms were right there. So that's why I did it like that. So it was just the blue of the sky, black for uh, shadows and white, the dest destroyed houses. So. So Avital, you just yeah. mentioned Notre Dame right. and how you were, uh, you know, trying to reduce it because you didn't like the stone and so on. And here we are now yeah. in front of a watercolor. Right. And that is an image of Notre Dame. Right. I really like this work because it is so fresh and so, um, you know, reduced in some yes. ways. You see still the towers of Notre Dame. You don't have the rosette. You have, she takes, Avital takes everything away from this and looks at the essence. Right. right. Yeah? Yes. Uh, yes, I, well, I was sort of gravitated towards Notre Dame because I found it also in a fantastic setting uh, being hugged by the two arms of the Seine and the two bridges. And, uh, and I thought, it, it, absolutely, and I liked the front. The, 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 the sides are more interesting with the flying buttresses, but I wanted the simplicity of the front. So that's why I painted it that way. And uh, yes, and then I, I sort of gravitated there every single day and I spent hours and I walked up along the Seine and back and, uh, and I was totally mesmerized. And then uh, uh, what happened? And then I started to remove, everything was too materialistic, too much the stone. So I started to remove, not this one, but uh, some of my other drawings or paintings because I felt it's, it, I'm trying to get the spirit and it's too much the stone, so I removed a, a lot. And I finally thought I'm not a painter anymore because I come back to the white canvas. And then I was really very distraught because what's the matter with me? <laughs> See, I so, think you were, you were about 30 years ahead of your time because that notion Yes. is a minimalist notion yes. that got really looked at much yes. later in time. Well, yeah. So I decided I, and I have enough of it and I bought a bouquet of flowers and I came to my hotel room where I lived and these were, I forgot, they're very colorful uh, colors, red with black inside of, I forgot what it's called. and. Uh, then somebody came to visit me, uh, my cousin, 
And I said, you know, for once I didn't paint Notre Dame, I paint uh, the flowers. And she said, where is it? I said, on my easel. When I went to the easel, I, I was shocked because the flowers were gone and it was the rose window. The flowers, you know, the violet and red and black lines, very strong. And I didn't even know that I had painted that. It was really disturbing that I didn't know what I had painted. I had sort of a mystic moment. I yes. was totally, I said, oh, again. And so after that, um, I went to gold and where the light was very strong. And that's why I went just with a pencil because I'm not a painter anymore. I remove everything. Everything is an overstatement. And then, of course, that it influenced me that I thought it was beautiful in what it was. But this was the exact opposite. It was sort of a dreamy um, uh, place to, to, to be haunted by. To make. Yeah, right. Yeah, thank you. Abita, thank you for well, thank you so being much. here with me well, thank you. And, and being open to all these questions. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so, so much, much for yes. the wonderful questions. I hope I did OK. Thank you. So that concludes today's session and interview, and I will see you in December. <laughs>